Well, good evening and welcome to our video sermon from Libanus Church. Just one announcement before we begin the service, and that is that we are producing as a church these flyers telling everybody what we are doing for Christmas. And so if you would like one of these flyers, but you're self-isolating or you're unable to be in the church this week or next week, then please do get in touch with me and I'd be happy to drop a few round for you to share with friends, family, neighbours and anyone who you think needs to hear the good news this Christmas that Jesus has come to bring forgiveness. We're going to be having an online Christmas Eve carol service. So if you know uh, somebody who doesn't want to come into a church building, doesn't want to come to church, well, they can sit watching it in their pyjamas. This year is a very different year. It's a very difficult year. But both of our services, both our Christmas Day and our Christmas Eve service, will be recorded and will be put online for anyone to watch from the comfort of their own home. But if you would like to join us on Christmas Day to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, the birth of our Saviour, if you want to join us, please do get in touch with us and let us know, just so we can organise the, the socially distanced seating and make sure that everyone is safe as possible. So if you are intending on, co on coming on Christmas Day in person, please can you let uh, me or someone from the church know, just so we can prepare for that. Shall we come now to a time of prayer as we open up the service? Father, we thank you that you are the almighty God. We thank you for Christmas. We thank you for the, the joy that Jesus has come. He has come to set us free. He has come to defeat death. He has come to destroy sin. We thank you that in Jesus, freedom is offered. Freedom is available. We pray, Lord, for anyone in our church who is struggling at this time of coronavirus. We pray for anyone who has got great difficulties or worries. We pray for anyone who is in hospital at the moment. We pray for those in our church who are waiting for test results, who are going through surgeries, those who have had surgeries postponed, those who are waiting for tests and don't know when they're going to get the diagnosis. Father, we just pray that at Christmas you would be close to them. We pray, Lord, that whatever happens with their health, we pray they would know the comfort of the risen, conquering Jesus Christ. We pray that you would be a blessing and a comfort to them, a great source of strength, of joy. Father, we thank you that, as the great uh, hymn says, and as the great Bible verse proclaims, that Christ is our solid rock that all other ground is sinking sand. But we thank you, Lord, that on Christ, who is our solid rock, we can stand firmly. Whatever difficulties come this Christmas, whatever problems and issues arise this year, we thank you that we can have a trust and a hope in a saviour who is bigger than any of our problems. Father, be with all of us. But this evening, Lord, we pray especially for the preaching. As we come to your, your word, as we come and we open up scripture, as we come and as we open up who you are, we pray that your spirit will be working. We pray that your spirit will be moving. We pray that today the risen Jesus Christ would meet with us. Father, bless everyone watching this video and encourage them in who our great and mighty Lord Jesus Christ is. Amen. If you've got your Bibles this evening, I'm going to be looking at Exodus chapter 12. Exodus 12. Tonight's reading is taken from the book of Exodus and chapter 12 and starting at verse 29. At midnight, 
the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who was sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone and bless me also. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewellery and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favour in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them and have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had bought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. Shall we pray before we approach this passage? Father, we do pray that you would be speaking here this evening. We pray that you would encourage us and build us up in the truth of who you are and what you have done for us. Amen. Now, as we approach this famous Christmas passage, I, I know it's not very Christmassy. I, I know that, so, so please don't tell me. I know it's not a Christmassy passage, but I want us to be reminded of very similar themes. I want us to be reminded of similar topics that are commonly found in the Nativity story. This might not appear to be the most joyful or Christmas related passage. But there are a lot of similarities and hopefully at the end of this sermon you will see that there is so much joy that comes from this passage. We always say that joy is one of the, the key things of Christmas. One of the big things about Christmas is that even the most miserable of us, people like me, even we should be a bit joyful at Christmas. And I hope that you come to see that this passage is a passage that has so much joy in it. Just before I begin, I just want to go through the context. I'm sure many of you know this story, either because you've read it from the Bible or because you've seen the Prince of Egypt DreamWorks film. But I'm sure you'll know the context that this was written in. The Israelites are enslaved in Egypt. God's chosen people are in slavery. They have been crying out for years and years to God to save them, to deliver them, to step down and help them. And now what we have is God has sent somebody. God has chosen Moses, who he has sent to deliver his people out of the hand of the Egyptians. At this point in the story, nine plagues have already hit Egypt. 
And all of these nine plagues have decimated this great nation. It has constantly changed the way that they would have had to have lived. Ordinary life would have been disrupted. We know a little bit about that, don't we? But Egypt has been completely shaped and changed and altered by the power of God. But still, Pharaoh will not give up his people. Pharaoh will not give up the Israelites. After all, they're his slaves. How else are things going to get built? Who else is going to fund and build the construction of Egypt? Who else would be cheaper than slaves? Pharaoh is not willing to give up his people. And what we see from this passage is that God makes it uh, plain. God makes it clear. The Israelites are not Pharaoh's people. The Israelites are God's people. And for those of us who know Jesus, we are not owned by anyone else. Nobody else has claim over us. Nobody else is in charge of us entirely and completely. Though God places people in positions of authority. But ultimately, for those of us who know Jesus, we belong to the King of Kings. The Lord of Lords. That is who our, is our ruler. That is who our, our master is. We belong to God himself. And that is the context for where we are in the story. And I've only got two points this evening. And my first point is the firstborn. At this point, there's been a lot of other plagues. However, this plague has got a very human element to it. Can you think of anything worse, anything harder, anything more difficult than dealing with the loss of a loved one, with a bereavement, coping with a death, getting to grips with life without someone else? This is a very personal and real plague. The other thing we learn And we need to notice that the firstborn was a symbol, a symbol or a sign of what is to come. The firstborn would have been the pride of joy, the apple of their eye. It would have been a sign that the next generation would have been fine and fit and healthy and powerful. The firstborn son would have brought so much joy. And comfort. The firstborn is so important at showing the future of the great Egyptian empire. It is a sign of the great power. And yet what we see in this play is God is king. God is ruler. God is bigger than any earthly power. There is not an earthly kingdom that can stand in the way of God. For God takes away the future, the hope of this supposedly great nation. The most powerful nation on earth at that time. God is still stronger than it. God has been a patient God. And we see this because this is not the first plague that God has sent. If God had wanted to, God would have sent such a a horrendous plague first. That way it would have saved the other nine. If God had sent this plague first, then we would know this story as being the plague of Egypt instead of the ten plagues of Egypt. God has given nine chances at least already for Pharaoh to repent. For Pharaoh to send his people, for for Pharaoh to, to give in and say that they're God's people. God hasn't jumped to this final plague. God has been merciful and slow to wrath in so many ways. 
And today I just want to ask a similar question to you. How many times have you heard about Jesus Christ? How many times have you heard the warning about God? How many times have you heard and rejected? How many times have you heard and hardened your heart? How many times have you turned away from the truth that you need to accept Jesus into your life? Have you responded and accepted Jesus Christ or are you like Pharaoh finding reasons and excuses to ignore God? I wonder, why don't you trust in Jesus for the first time today? Now God is about to enact the final plague and once God sends this plague, even Pharaoh is done. Even Pharaoh admits that he is powerless to resist the Almighty. There's nothing he can do to stop God. Verse 29. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of all the livestock. In the previous verses, this is very important, I'm sure you're well aware, but God gave the command that the blood of the lamb was to be placed on the doorposts of every home, that these instructions were to be followed, and everyone who followed these instructions would be safe. The blood of the lamb is saving. It is precious. The judgment of God will not harm anyone who is touched with the blood of the lamb. In verse 29, we see an equality of God's judgment. Are you rich this evening? If so, please feel free to share with me. I'm not going to say no if you want to give me a, a big check. But I wonder, are you comfortable? Have you got lots of lovely holidays planned for when COVID calms down? Are you doing fine financially? Have you got all of your expensive gifts ready for Christmas? Or are you less well off? This Christmas, are you struggling for the bare minimum? Are you struggling just to put food on the table? Are you covered in debt? Have you got no way to pay for this coming Christmas? Because whether you're rich or whether you're poor, God's judgment is the great equaliser. It doesn't matter if you're the one sat on the throne or the one in a dungeon. Anyone, everyone, who has not been washed by the blood of the Lamb, has no way of escaping God's judgment. That's what we see so clearly from this story. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, it doesn't matter. The one thing that matters is, do you know that Jesus died for you? This was literal for the Israelites, and it's literal for us now. Trust in Jesus. Trust in the blood that was spilt at Calvary. And the judgment that you deserve, forgiven, passes by, passes over you. Accept Jesus. And when God looks at your life, he won't see all the wrong things that you've done. He won't see all of the wrong things that I've done. He will see the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus, and he will know you have been forgiven. In full, completely, absolutely, all of what you've done wrong, forgiven. This is the power of the power of the blood of the Lamb. Verse 30. And Pharaoh rose up in the night. He and all of his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt. For there was not a house where someone was not dead. 
It was not a house where someone was not dead. This is obviously talking about those who have, were not covered by the blood of the Lamb. But there's so much I could say about this if I had the time. But I'll say this, we need to be praying for our leaders. Both at this time, which is so difficult, but at every time in human history, we need to pray for those who are in authority over us. Look at the pain and devastation that is caused by an ungodly ruler who will not submit to the will of God, who hardens his heart against God. Pray for godly leaders. But there's an obvious question. And people often ask it, how could God do that to the firstborn of Egypt? How could God make such a difficult decision? Why would God do that to so many people? How would God allow it? How was God able to bring himself to such a position that he killed all the firstborn? How could he do that? And I'm sure it was a difficult decision for God to take. It was a drastic decision for God to take. But this, was, this is not the last time that God allows a death of the firstborn. We read elsewhere in the Bible. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them at the inn. Jesus Christ was the firstborn son of Mary. And what do we read in Colossians 1 and verse 20? Speaking of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, Colossians 1 and verse 20 says this, Jesus was making peace by the blood of the cross. That is what Jesus Christ did. He made peace by the blood of his cross. And I find it truly breathtaking that what God did to the Egyptians, he was also prepared to do to his only son, to his firstborn son. Everything that we've discussed about firstborns really can be considered true of Jesus. The worth, the value, the love that the Father has for the Son is unquantifiable. God the Father loves God the Son wholly and completely and perfectly. The reason why God killed the firstborns of Egypt and the reason why God sent Jesus to die on the cross is exactly the same. He did both because he loved his people. Why did God send the tenth plague against the Egyptians? Because he loved his people. Why did God send Jesus to die on the cross for us? Because he loves his people. I find it truly wonderful that God did not put the Egyptians through anything that he was not prepared to go through himself. For God the Father knows what it is like for his own son to die, for his own son to be punished. God knows what that is like. And yet Christ came anyway to make peace by his blood on the cross. Today, if you are a Christian, you need to feel loved. This evening, I want to encourage you that you are loved. God loves you so much. The wailing and the crying out in Egypt, the pain and the anguish. Just, just think how painful it was for the Father. Knowing that his holy, his perfect son, who has done nothing wrong, is dying 
bearing the pain, the weight, the agony, the misery, the penalty of everything that I've done wrong. Of everything that every Christian has ever done wrong, Christ bore it all on the cross. Christ, who is fully God, came down to die upon that cross. Jesus came to earth. He died for you. If you're a Christian, this is how you can see the love of God. This is how you know how much God loves you. That he did not hold anything. He did not withhold anything from you. His own son he gave and that's what we celebrate at Christmas. God's firstborn, God's only son, died on the cross to bring us freedom. What love the Father loves you with that he sent the Son. That is a firstborn. My second point is what is the result? of the death of the firstborn. Verse 31. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and he said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go, serve your God, as you've said. This is the result of the death of the firstborn. My second point is freedom. Freedom. This happens very quickly. Verse 31 lets us know that it's still the night. God sent the tenth plague at midnight. And so this is so soon after the plague has hit that Pharaoh is just overwhelmed and he just says, go away. There's nothing more Pharaoh can do to resist God. The death of the firstborn of Egypt has brought about the freedom for God's people. Pharaoh sends them off. He says, go serve your God. He doesn't want anything more to do. He doesn't want to try and resist God further. He doesn't want anything to do with these people who've caused such grief and pain and agony for himself. Can you imagine what it must have been like to have no control over what you do? Or where you go. The Israelites have finally got freedom. They were slaves for so long. Imagine the crushing dominance of slavery. Imagine how difficult it must have been. Day in, day out. To have no control over where you go. Or what you do. The Israelites were in complete captivity, being forced hard, hard manual labour. No freedom, no relief, no peace and quiet. And now God has brought about freedom. These people finally have got their lives back. What a day of rejoicing that must be. Verse 37 is so encouraging. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. And I want you to think very carefully about this. There is a reason that the Jewish people kept referencing back to this great event. 600,000 men were set free from the bondage of slavery. That 600,000 men, that doesn't include women and children. That probably means that there was most likely well over a million people declared free because of what God has done for them. Over a million people who were, were slaves one day. When they went to bed, they were slaves. And when they woke up, they were free. This is the power of God. A million people freed from the bondage of slavery in a single day. 
Verse 41. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. All of these years living in a foreign land, the hardness and difficulty of slavery, of oppression, of mistreatment, in one day of God working, freedom has been realised. This is a glorious event. God is the mighty champion of salvation. But I want you to think through history. I want you to try and count. It's impossible to do so, but I want you to try and guess. How many Christians do you think there have been throughout history? How many people do you think Jesus Christ has set free from the bondage of their sin? How many people do you think were living as slaves to sin one day and then in a day? Maybe through the preaching of the word. Maybe through watching a video similar to this. They realised Christ died for me and they put their trust in him. How many millions of people do you think Christ has redeemed and rescued throughout history? Tens of millions of people have been set free. Spiritually, they have been set free. Each and every Christian, through the blood of the firstborn, Jesus Christ, have been set free. The Exodus is a shockingly immense story of slaves becoming free. I absolutely adore it. But think about how many Christians have been set free from the burden of their guilt and shame. And this is an even bigger thing to be rejoicing about. This Christmas, we've got a thousand leaflets. And that's a lot of leaflets for you to give out. And the great thing about the virtual leaflets, the, we're going to put them online and you can share them online. They can be shared as many times as you like. God is a redeeming God. God is a powerful God. God is a God who in a single day can take someone from slavery into life. Christian, do you believe that this Christmas? Are you praying for that this Christmas? How many people have you prayed for to be saved this Christmas? For our God is the God of redemption and of salvation. Be glad this Christmas. Pray this Christmas. Take the good news to people this Christmas. Because God is a saving God. The Exodus story tells us that clearly, that God is a redeeming God. And our God has never stopped redeeming. The whole purpose of sending Jesus to this earth was to bring freedom. That's why Jesus came this Christmas. As Christians... We can be in awe at the prominent display of God's saving care, concern and power for his people. But through Jesus, we can know this personally for ourselves. And I want to end just by reading a verse from the Gospels. John chapter 8 and verse 36 is a fantastic verse. In this section, it says that the truth will set you free. We've talked about true freedom. The truth of Jesus Christ will set you free. This evening, it has the power to set you free. But John 8 and verse 36 declares, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If you are a Christian here tonight from this difficult and hard passage, remember this. Jesus was born. The firstborn of Mary. Christ was born into this earth to bring us freedom. And let me assure you that if Jesus Christ has set you free, no matter what this world throws at you, no matter what difficulties you face, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. Now and forever. Amen. Shall we pray to close our service? 
Father, we thank you that in Christ there is full forgiveness. We thank you that you did not just save the Israelites and then move on and forget about your people. But we thank you that your character, your nature, is inherently a God who has loved his people enough for Christ to die on the cross for us. We thank you that the great pain, the great suffering that you would have felt as you died for us on the cross, we thank you that you died because of your love for us. And Father, we cannot take it in. Father, we are overwhelmed by the freedom that we can have in Christ. The freedom from our sins. The freedom to follow you. The freedom to love you and to know you and to embrace you. Father, this Christmas, we want to be bold. As your church of Libanus, we want to be bold as we say, save people this Christmas. This very Christmas, why not take somebody who is a slave to their own desires, a slave to the wrong that they've done, why not save them? You've saved me. And there is no reason to do that. And you've saved many people watching this video. So, Father, we cry out, redeem more. In just one day, in Christmas, bring people into a new freedom of Jesus Christ. We know that you are the only one, only by the blood of the Lamb, only by the blood of Jesus Christ, can people have true freedom. Oh, Father, we pray that this Christmas, you will set people free. This Christmas will be very different because of COVID, but we pray it will be a joyful Christmas because Christ has brought life into the hearts of our loved ones. Revive this land, we pray. Set us free. Amen. Well, may God be with you and bless you this evening.